welcome. This is lecture 19. Can you believe it? Wow. Um, this is really going to be a fun talk. I wanted to give you a quick preview and actually a couple of stories. First of all, um, have you ever done a cross-country trip in the car and you look at your gas gauge and gosh, you know, it's a quarter empty and then it's, you know, it's, you're almost down to the last couple miles and you think like, oh, I can get to that next gas station. And, and of course it's closed. I can get to that next gas station. And you're driving on fumes at some point. You're just praying the car keeps going. Well, I'm on fumes today because I've been moving my house and I'm just totally exhausted. But it's so nice to take a break and look how pretty it is. So I only have one slide that I prepared. And what do Starbucks, Seattle Police Department, and smartphones have to do with your weight loss goals? Anybody, anybody? So here's the story. So a couple weeks ago, you know how when your smartphone, you update it and you get updates for your apps and you don't check those until you use them and you realize you don't know the password. So I'm in Starbucks, really happy, waiting for my latte. Get up to pay and it's like, crap, new app and I, I don't know the password. I'm getting all nervous and I'm flustered. There are 12 people behind me in line. And she says, oh, don't worry about it. This is happening to everybody and we'll, we'll give you freebies. So, I stepped over and I'm still fiddling with my phone. I finally get my password to work and log in. It looks all different when I'm able to use it. I think like, geez, this is really stressful. I just came here for a relaxing cup of coffee. So two weeks later, same Starbucks, I walk in and just on the other door, there are two entrances, the uh, uh, district police chief walks in. I've seen him before. And so we both arrive at the line at the same time. He's very gallant, you know, please go ahead. And so I get my latte. And I I turn behind him, and he's fiddling with his iPhone. <laughs> he's looking really nervous. And he says, you know, I, I don't know my password. I'm thinking, like, damn, I just did that. <laughs> so I kind of, you know, gave him a conspiratorial smile and stepped aside. And they gave him the same free drink, and he's stepping over here, and he says, oh, I, I, I just, I can't fix, I can't figure this out. And so we just started chit-chatting. I thought, wow, you know, here's the police chief and me, and we have the exact same problem. So I think as you look around, you look at your own weight loss journey, you're just not alone. There are other people with the same kind of stories. Just when you think you're panicking or things aren't working or you're stressed or anxious about something, you know, I bet you a lot of other folks feel the same way. So just remembering that story. So, so uh, half of our duo is not here. I so much apologize. So uh, Alexia Spanos is very ill, but her fabulous partner in crime. <laughs> uh, Angela Doyle is going to do her talk. She works at a medical weight loss disorders, uh, medical uh, disorders clinic uh, a couple blocks from here, I think, a couple blocks. And she used to help out with some of our support groups. It's just fantastic. So I'm going to get her slides and ready to go for you. I work at the evidence-based treatment centers of Seattle, and so that's a clinic um, on Fifth Avenue where um, it's made up of about 25 psychologists and other therapists and a psychiatrist, and we treat all kinds of things, anxiety disorders. Um, thank you. Um, mood dysregulation and eating disorders. So um, uh, Peter Doyle and myself are the co-directors there. And so in terms of eating disorders, we deal with all kinds of eating related issues that people have from kids to adults. And I've, was, I've been very lucky to have been um, uh, connected with uh, Dr. Baumgartel here. Uh, my, as I was training, one of the things I worked a lot on was weight management for kids and then eventually for adults. Um, I spent some time in Chicago too where I did a lot of work with post-bariatric surgery uh, patients. Um, so it's something that is, is very, um, so her program is just wonderful. I keep telling her she's the best healthy weight management program I've ever heard of, honestly. It incorporates all the right parts. And um, in the talk that I have for you today actually reflects a part that um, Dr. Baumgartel does I think pay a lot of attention to that many people don't, which is body image. And it has a more important role than you would think. Um, so that's what I was hoping to talk to you about today. Um, as she said, unfortunately, Dr. Spanos is sick today, so there'll be parts, there'll probably be slides where I think, hmm, what, what was she going to say on that slide? Mm -hmm. But um, it's something that we talk about quite often. Um, so without further ado, um, the, um, the concept of body image is one that we can think about from sort of the more global perspective of what is body image and kind of how is it constructed down to us as individuals, what is our image of our own body. And there's a lot of steps in between that global piece and then where we find ourselves. Um, and so I thought I'd start off first telling you a little bit about how do, we, how do we even get set up thinking about body image 
And then how do we get to our own sort of evaluation of ourselves? And then why does it matter, especially for a program like this? We are thinking about um, healthy weight management. Um, so first we'll start, again, with that global message. And I think the first place we all tend to look is what we see around us, and the media is in particular a, um, a ripe source for images, um, for body image comparison. Um, I, I, we were just saying before the talk began that uh, I've heard before that just about every single image we see nowadays, um, digital image, has been modified in some way, whether it's a filter or whether it's shaving off a, a an elbow here or neck there, or any, you know, any kind of little thing, they're, they're changing. So you get a very distorted view of what an average body looks like. Um, Alexia came up with this slide and she chose some images that were representative of, of maybe a different age group than what we normally think of. Oftentimes when we do body image talks, we're thinking about teenagers and kind of the, the pressures that they feel, but adults are not immune from this either. Um, you can see Woman's World and the Real Housewives. And you even get a Cialis uh, ad where, where the men are looking so svelte and, and dashing. And um, it really, it kind of sets up a standard that is, is in some ways not representative of the majority of, many ways it's not representative of the majority of uh, the population. Um, and this is an example of those digital images that get so frequently um, <clears throat> modified without our knowledge. Um, this was a Red Book cover where if you, Compare back and forth and back and forth, you can begin to see some of the changes they made, including um, making Faith Hill's arm more slender and kind of placing an arm to make her waist look very small, curving off some of the back, the back um, uh, skin, and even erasing some of the lines on her face. And most people are pretty appalled at this because they look at the picture on the left and think, gosh, she's beautiful. She just looks perfect. But somehow the people with, uh, uh, in charge of the cover decided to change her. And here's just a couple other images to show you that it's, it's, it's really quite striking because these are, are people who look quite wonderful to begin with um, and are getting modified. Men also are subject to this, James Bond, then and now. <laughs> you can see the, the changing standards for, for men, which is pretty unrealistic there on the right. Um, and over time, you see this, this trend happening. This is a slide. It actually is from many years ago that the, this chart only shows you until 1987. These are years along the bottom. And along this axis is percent expected body weight. And um, the two lines represent uh, Playboy centerfolds and Miss America pageant winners. And you can see that they never even started up at 100% of expected body weight. And then over all those decades, they just kept getting lower and lower. If you imagine 85% of expected weight is, is a, um, a general cutoff, or it's a suggested cutoff for anorexia nervosa, you can see just how, how, severe, how severely low people's weights have gotten in terms of what's considered in some ways some sort of ideal of beauty. Um, and it becomes more and more unrealistic and unattainable. So this is a thin ideal. I mean, that is, I think for, for men, you might also suggest that there's also a muscular ideal. But so often in the research, we're talking about what's the, the thin ideal. And that ideal is one that has become even more thin over time. Um, now, as we're measuring, though, to what extent do people have body dissatisfaction, we do start to think about how much do you actually internalize that? Because there are some people for whom they don't internalize this. They don't take this on as that this is the image, this is the, the image of beauty or of, of attractiveness. They, they actually don't um, integrate it much at all. And in fact, when you look at um, other cultures or people immigrating into the United States from um, different countries, um, for instance, uh, this is probably a few decades ago now, but if you looked at immigrants from um, Asian countries, for instance, people would come in and there wouldn't necessarily be this, this um, internalization of the thin ideal, or from African countries, or from actually most countries. And then um, as they become more acculturated to the United States, they become more also acculturated to this thin ideal, and they become more at risk for eating disorders, actually. Um, let's do reflections in this mirror, maybe distorted socially constructed ideas of beauty. So this is where I wanted to take a moment and think about, I want you to think about yourself and sort of see how, how influenced are you by this than ideal. These are some items from a questionnaire that are, that's often given in research to determine body image uh, dissatisfaction. So the first one is, I would like my body to look like the models who appear in magazines. I wish I looked like the models in music videos. I felt pressure from TV or magazines to diet. 
I felt pressure from TV and magazines to be thin. These are just four items, but these are obviously yes or no questions, and in this measure, you would add up all the number of them, and, and it would put you in sort of a category of whether or not you've internalized the thin ideal or not. Um, another measure of body dissatisfaction looks at, has people rate their bodies both real, like what, what do they believe their body to look like, and then what's their ideal? Um, now the idea is, is that if you internalize that thin ideal, it's most likely that you're going to be rating bodies on this left-hand side. Um, and that is, it, it's really unfortunate in the sense that not everyone's going to be on that left-hand side. Just naturally in the population, people are going to be larger than those left-hand figures. And in fact, such a small percentage of people actually meet this thin ideal that there's inherently going to be dissatisfaction if you're comparing yourself to a thin ideal. So we do this real versus ideal, this discrepancy that's a score that, that's calculated to, to determine degree of body dissatisfaction. Um, and just to beat that point a little further too, if you're someone who is able to look at the middle range there or the higher range and say, I actually find that the, that body is ideal for me and is really attractive and you're somewhere near that point, that's great. That means you're, you're kind of, your, your body dissatisfaction is a little bit lower. Um, so in terms of, they've done prospective studies. These are studies where they looked at people over time um, and, and measured how they change over time and what happens to them. And looking at people who do have, um, who have internalized the thin ideal quite a bit, it actually has been a risk factor for the development of eating disorders. And eating disorders aren't just bulimia nervosa and anorexia nervosa. It's also binge eating disorder, which actually affects many more people than bulimia or anorexia. Um, that's a pattern of binge eating without any sort of ways of compensating for that food, getting rid of it in any way. So it, it's oftentimes associated with weight gain. Um, and even just disordered eating, too. People tend to eat in very disordered ways when they've internalized an ideal quite a bit. Um, this is the point that Alexia, who actually has a background in genetic uh, studies, would be, make a better point about. But um, genetic factors contribute to half of the variance in this. And this idea that the, internaliz the degree of internalization of the thin ideal is somehow genetically um, related, it's, it's quite interesting. And I think that the, the people who've um, done these studies really link it to personality traits that are genetically transmitted, things like perfectionism and other sorts of um, more kind of rule-driven, rigid sorts of ways of, of thinking and being. So this leads us to the sort of kind of sad reality, which is that there is a degree of normative discontent. This is the phrase we use often. Just about everyone feels negatively about their body to some degree. Um, so this is different surveys over the different decades and showing the, the levels of dissatisfaction by men and women about all different areas of their body. So this has become more normative. Um, now, one other element, so um, there's, the, there's body dissatisfaction, which is how different are you from what you think your ideal is. And then there's also the degree to which you find it important how you look, how your, what your size is, what your shape is, what your weight is. And these appearance assumptions um, can really contribute a lot to body dissatisfaction or, or unhappiness with one's body. If it's really important to you that you look a certain way and then you're also, it's, if there's a discrepancy there, you're going to feel particularly bad. So these are assumptions that many people hold. I'm going to read them off because I, I want to take a moment just to think about them. Um, physically attractive people have it all. My worth as a person depends on how I look. The first thing people will notice about me is what's wrong with my physical appearance. Uh, by managing my physical appearance, I can control my social and emotional life. If I could look just as I wish, my life would be much happier. And my culture's messages make it impossible for me to be satisfied with my appearance. Um, if you're anything like most people, there's going to be at least one of these where you'll think, well, yeah, that, that makes sense. But this is a, these are assumptions that many people make that really contribute to negative body image. And in fact, it's taken from, I'm going to show you the workbook now just because it's a, it's a relevant time to bring it up. But these are all assumptions that are mentioned in this body image workbook, um, which is a self-guided self -guided program to helping to learn to like your looks. And it actually expands beyond weight or shape or anything. It also is relevant for people who aren't happy with their, um, their complexion or their size of their nose or those sorts of things by Thomas Cash. So it's a great uh, book. And we actually use this a lot with clients we work with to kind of guide them through it. Um, but challenging these things. These are all thoughts, they're assumptions. And we can challenge these because these aren't, aren't necessarily true. We should be very, very skeptical of these assumptions. So the goal is to think healthy thoughts. Now, where, where does uh, healthy weight management come in here? Well, 
if we're in integrating this idea that a thin body or a muscular body or whatever is this ideal, then that's going to create um, this dissatisfaction and most people are going to feel like they need to lose weight. That's going to be a very common urge people have. <clears throat> and so then we think about the diet industry, which is just a multi-million dollar, probably more than that actually. It, it's a huge industry and no matter where you look, you can find these ads. It's, it's really quite prevalent. Um, even on TV, I have two little kids now and, and I'm very sensitive to them seeing these messages and of course you turn on the TV and if they see a commercial, it's almost impossible to avoid them seeing some you know, Brazilian butt lift uh, <laughs> ad or, uh, you know, <laughs> the Hollywood cookie diet or something. You think, oh my gosh, how do I explain this? This is ridiculous. Um, but the fact is, and um, this is things I'm sure that Dr. Baumgartel has, has um, spoken to you about before, is that diets, um, diets really don't work. And by diet, I'm meaning a really restrictive, kind of highly calorie controlled, um, uh, ex extreme sort of way of being that's not not sustainable, you know, it's not a, a lifestyle sort of thing. And um, certainly in short term, uh, in the short term people can lose weight that way, but um, I think if you haven't had that experience yourself, you know someone who has who's lost a certain amount of weight and then they gain it back, it's really hard to keep it off. And in fact, behavioral weight management programs generally don't have a huge amount of success with long-term weight loss, I mean, maybe 10% of body weight and it's for five years maybe. Um, I'm not sure what the most recent data are on that, but it's it's really kind of a limited outcome. So um, an idea is, is if it's too restrictive, it's not going to be easy enough to follow. Um, weight oftentimes is gained back, and sometimes even more weight is gained back than what was originally lost. Um, and the thing that I deal with most in the clinic I work in <clears throat> is that overly restrictive eating can really drive up preoccupation with food and body, which can, if you just imagine in terms of you only have a certain percentage of attention towards things in your life, you're, you're really narrowing down everything else in life and you're thinking about food and body and weight more, which really takes away from, from living, I would say. Um, and in addition, um, I'll come back to this, but it can actually drive the occurrence of binge eating, which is a real problem for healthy weight management. I'll talk about that more. Now, it turns out that the shape of one's body is, is also very largely affected by genetics. and. Um, I see this a lot too because I work with a lot of kids and this makes me so sad, but I think that um, a lot of people believe that um, all kids should be at the 50th percentile for their weight, that that's sort of where everyone should end up. But the tr truth of it is, is that there is a bell curve of where people are and that someone can be very healthy in the 70th percentile or the 80th percentile or so on, um, just like someone could be in the 20th percentile and be very healthy. Um, so it's more than about weight, and that's something that's so great about this program, I know, is that you can really consider many factors about health. It's not just weight. Um, and this is a quote from a, a researcher on eating disorders. He says, dieters and people with eating disorders demonstrate the ability to suppress their body weight temporarily. However, they're not relieved of the constant physiological pressures to return to the natural weight their bodies prefer. So there is, this is in reference to something called the set point theory of weight, that people just generally naturally will gravitate towards a certain weight. And to try to fight that, to try to fight their biology, is going to just inherently be a, a, a losing battle. So I wanted to, at this point, um, bring up some myths, though. This, this is where we start to get into more about the sort of the role of body image in healthy weight management. Um, some myths that I've heard quite often. First off, that hating your body can be good. People think, well, no, it's good that I don't like the way my stomach is or the way my rear end is because it's going to keep me motivated. I'm going to put that picture of myself up from college and I'm going to just keep working to get back to that. And that's going to be my inspiration. Um, so I'll tell you the policy there in a moment. Also, this idea that you should constantly be striving for a better appearance, that there's never a point at which you can say, yeah, I'm fine the way I look. This is great. Let's, let's move on. Let's think about something else now. Um, and then the third one, you have to hear me out on this one. But the goal is to love how you look. This is a particular one I'm going to make a point of. You know, here. I'm going to say these are myths. Let's not consider these as truths. Um, instead, it turns out that hating your body actually makes it more difficult. And, dis and disliking your body makes it more difficult to manage your weight healthfully. And I'll say more about that momentarily. Um, and for the second one, this idea that you should always be striving to look better, this is, this is where those body image assumptions come in, and or appearance assumptions. And I would say, really, that's a moment at which you'd want to step back and think, what would it be like to not be so preoccupied with the way I look, and particularly with weight or shape? Um, what, what else in your life is important to your self-esteem? Um, I often draw on a board for, for the clients I work with, a, a pie chart where you think about what contributes to how you feel about yourself. 
appearance usually takes some kind of wedge because I think appearance is important for us. It can make us feel um, confident. It can um, help with, you know, if you really are looking spiffy, you can get a, get a good job. You can um, uh, attract romantic partners. It's, it's important to, to a certain extent to, to think about your attractiveness, but there should be so many other things in that pie chart more than just weight and shape. Um, I'm sure all of you know someone in your lives who is probably so preoccupied with their weight and shape that it just it takes up so much of their self-esteem that they, they um, aren't able to derive a lot of satisfaction um, in life. In terms of the goal of loving your body, I'm going to propose that the goal should actually be to appreciate, respect, and make peace with your body. And the reason why I make that distinction is I think to say that you're going to love your body is a little bit of a high standard and one that maybe isn't realistic, that we're all going to have this Zen moment of, you know, oh, we love everything about our bodies. And we all have something, you know, I don't like the way my hands look and I don't like the way, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. But the, the idea is that to, to really appreciate that our bodies are wonderful things and, um, and to respect it, not hate it, not to speak to it like you would speak to, um, well, be very critical of it. I think we're all so much more critical of ourselves than other people. So there was um, there's a study done. Actually, I'll tell you about the study in just a moment. But but I wanted to draw out specifically how we looked at in the research how we looked at poor body image and how that inf influences healthy weight management now. So you have poor body image, and that's been linked, again, perspectively. So they've looked at when someone starts with bo low body, poor body image, what happens to them then over time, over the years. They've done this with teenagers, they've done this with adults. And they find that when people have poor body image, they engage in some kind of problem eating. And it's problematic attitudes towards eating, mostly. One is this all or nothing approach to there's good foods and there's bad foods. There's things that I should eat and that I shouldn't eat. And it's, it's very rigid. And it actually lends, this, lends to this idea that if you don't stick to this, a uh, particular way of eating, then you failed somehow. Um, I know my um, someone, someone close to me was was uh, very into the uh, was it the paleo diet right now, and he he's become very rigid about it. And so um, you know, one day we I remember we had a, a a get together where there wasn't really anything available to him that was going to fit on his diet, and he did have something that wasn't really paleo paleo ribbit kind of. Um, and um, he was really disappointed. I mean, he was really, yeah. So, I mean, there's a risk of this all or nothing thinking of I'm either doing perfectly or else I'm failing. Um, in terms of low confidence with regards to eating, um, that has to do with this thing called self-efficacy, where you feel like, yeah, I can do this. And, and there's probably many of you here who at certain points in your life you think, I forget it, I just can't even stick to these healthy ways of eating anymore. I just, it's just not worth it. I'm going to throw in the towel. Um, and, and that's a, that's something that's been linked to, to poor body image too. People don't like the way they look. They, they feel a little bit less like they are efficacious in doing the right thing with, um, with eating. And I don't mean the right thing, like there's one right way, but just sort of feeling good about the way they eat. Then the final one is low disinhibition with eating. And that there's three, or three components there. One is emotional eating. So that would be when you're feeling really sad or really upset or lonely that you do turn to food. Um, when someone has poor body image, they do tend to be more likely to have emotional eating. Um, in addition to situational eatings, so that would be at the office party, you're not hungry, you just ate dinner, but hey, there's food there, I'm just going to eat anyway. Um, that's something that you're more likely to do if, if your body image is, is good. And then finally, habitual eating, and that would be eating because, hey, whatever, that's what I always do. I always go and, and uh, get a scone with my Starbucks coffee each time I go, and so that's what I'm going to get every time. I'm not going to really pay attention to what I really feel like that day. Another category of, of ways that uh, poor body image can be problematic for healthy weight management is um, more extreme weight control behaviors. So specifically things like skipping meals and fasting, which both of those things are a big no-no for healthy weight management. I'm sure that professionals you might have worked with or you've talked to would tell you the same thing. Not skip meals ever, um, do not fast, um, do not have a highly restricted and primarily, one of the things that this does, besides the preoccupation with food and eating that this engenders, it also um, creates a risk for binge eating. It's not that everyone who's on a restrictive diet binge eats, but when you have um, the sort of vulnerability of, of when you're uh, dieting too strictly, there's sort of a physical deprivation that, occur, that can occur, but also a psychological deprivation. Um, for, the, for the women here who've had babies, you might remember during pregnancy, how you've been told, okay, don't, don't drink alcohol and don't eat sushi or don't have soft cheeses. And of course, 
that's all you feel like having the entire time. It's this idea that if you're telling yourself you can't have something, you want it more. Um, and it's a really, it, it, it's a true psychological principle. So that's something where um, the lot of restriction, you're gonna feel deprived. And then there's, uh, there's another element there too, um, which is that, um, so you have poor body image, restrictive eating, kind of feeling of deprivation, and then usually what pulls the trigger then is oftentimes some kind of negative um, emotion. So that would be having a difficult day, you just had a fight with your partner, and that can kind of pull the trigger. Um, the most often pattern I see is that people restrict pretty strictly during the day, and then by the time they get home from work, they're just exhausted, they're hungry, they're feeling depleted, and um, something just pulls the trigger, and then they don't eat. So that's a very frequent uh, pattern, which can get in the way of healthy weight management. And then finally, um, different studies have looked at barriers to physical activity, um, and one of them um, is having poor body image, because if you feel like you don't like the way your body looks, particularly in exercise clothes or in whatever clothing you want to wear to get out and be active, um, or not even just the clothing itself, it's maybe the way your body moves and you feel very self-conscious and embarrassed about it, it's going to prevent you from being as, as willing to go out and do things um, to be active. So uh, this is a particularly poignant point for, for um, adolescents uh, with body image problems and who are working on weight management. So there's a recent study done in Portugal that I found really interesting. It was looking at a, a large number of um, overweight and obese women. And there was a healthy weight management program that sounded very similar to the one here um, for Many for Change. And um, they added a body image improvement component. And I don't know, I'm sure there's other programs that incorporate that, but I thought, gosh, it's taken a long time for them to actually include this as part of a, a controlled trial to figure out what, how does this influence things. And, um, it turns out that um, better body image through this kind of added component, um, they actually did see a change in the ability for people to self-regulate a bit with their eating. And so specifically things like being less in, uh, disinhibited with their eating and um, um, having more self-efficacy about how they can do well with eating, um, uh, as well as less likelihood about having the all or nothing thinking. All those things were changed in these women over this course of time that were in this particular, particular arm of the study. Um, one other element that was, was, if you haven't already guessed, I'm a big geek when it comes to research and stuff. That was, I was previously in the more academic field before I went into the clinical world. So um, I found this really interesting, and I hope you do too, which is that um, when you pull apart this idea of body image, there's actually two dimensions. There's body dissatisfaction, which is that difference between what your ideal is and how you see yourself. But then there's this, that, that idea of how invested are you in it to begin with? Like how important is it to you? To you, And both are important. Both are important in determining your self-esteem and things that are and, and important to, to help um, be successful in healthy weight management. But it turns out that reducing one's dysfunctional investment in appearance is more important. So if I were sitting down with someone to talk to them about their body image, I would think about, yeah, how dissatisfied are you with your body? But also, how important is, is it to you? I mean, what, what's the importance in your life of having this thin ideal or this particular ideal that may or may not be even realistic, um, depending on, on the situation? So that's a, a target. It's a, it's a very clear target for, um, uh, for people working on this topic. So, what are some take-home messages here? What are some things that we all should do? Well, first off, um, some of you might be familiar with this rec fairly recent movement called Health at Every Size, which has just been a blessing because I think it's finally gotten us out of this mindset of everyone needs to lose weight in this country. You know, I think that's a, a common theme. Um, and really start to think about all of us need to be healthier. I mean, what do we need to do to be healthy? In fact, I see a, a teenage girl who's um, who's medically overweight, you know, if you look on the charts, I mean, she is medically overweight, but she's very healthy. She's extremely active. She plays four different sports. Every day she's in a sports practice. She's, she's got great endurance. Um, just everything looks pretty spot on with her health. And so that would be the kind of person that, that we want to just celebrate and say, that's great. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing wonderfully. And, and thank goodness she actually has a really good body image, um, so we don't have to work on that. Um, but helping each other promote health um, instead of a particular size or shape is very important. And almost getting a little bit, um, what's the phrase that, that this guy uses? It's uh, just really almost, almost indignant um, about the kind of messages we're getting and where 
where should we all be to be healthy? Um, I, I do get, I get quite indignant. I get up on a soapbox quite often about messages that we might be given about how our bodies should be in order to be healthy. Um, there's no such thing as good foods or bad foods. So anytime you hear anyone saying, oh, that's not good to eat that, you shouldn't eat that, just smack them upside the head and say, no, just, there's no food that you can't eat, really. It's fine. Um, finding other ways to improve your self-esteem, not tied to your shape. Remind yourselves and each other of illusions of media and advertising. And challenge the accuracy of the appearance assumptions, and those are the ones that were up on the screen a few moments ago. Um, two other things. There's um, frequent behaviors that people do when they do have body dissatisfaction, and we can actually target these things. This is coming from a very behavioral kind of standpoint, but there's things that we can do differently to actually improve our body image. One of the things that many people do is compare themselves with others, but there's, there's automatic problems with the way we compare ourselves with others, oftentimes. One way is we often focus on just the good parts of the other person, like, wow, I just love her legs, she has the greatest legs. But then we're not even looking at the whole picture of their body, so we're just focusing on this one body part. If only my legs looked like hers. Um, we also don't scrutinize other people the same way we do ourselves. We're actually quite generous to other people, um, but not towards ourselves. Um, the halo effect is that you see someone who looks attractive or has the body shape that you think is attractive and you think, oh, they must have it all. Their lives must be great. You know, if only I could get there, I would just have a great life too. And that's, of course, a, a fallacy. There's, there's no reason to believe that someone who has a uh, really attractive body has a great life. Um, we also tend to compare up rather than down. Um, it's oftentimes when people have poor body image in particular, they're always looking at the people who are thinner or more attractive or have the better arms or have the, you know, whatever it is, and they rarely are comparing to people who maybe don't have the attributes that they're looking for. So the things that we would suggest in these situations is to take, really take a different approach. Um, one of the exercises we have people do is actually go to like a mall or um, even a Starbucks and just sit in every third person um, without regard to what you think they're going to look like to sort of just look at their bodies and sort of get a sense of what do other people's bodies look like. And um, that really gets you, to the, gets you out of that bias of always picking certain body types or the way certain people look. Um, another thing is um, to recognize that if you tell yourself, oh, I wish my thighs looked like that, to, to also recognize that you really have to change everything in your body. Uh, I hear this oftentimes, most often I'd say with, with um, younger women where, there's, where they'll say, I just, I just really want my, my waist to be different or my butt to be different. And, you really can't spot change things like that. It doesn't happen in, in, uh, in normal life. So you really have to change everything if you're gonna change one body part. And then finally, to pick the things you like about yourself and compare those. Um, I worked with one woman um, a number of years ago who, who was very, very self-conscious about her, her body shape. And so we started, she really liked her hair, so she would start just to focus and compare on people's hair. So it's a very effortful um, change, but it really helped her sort of decrease her investment in these other body parts and just start to think about different different things. Another common uh, behavior people do is body checking. And this can take many forms. It can be mirror checking. It can be trying on clothes that maybe used to fit. It's like, oh, do they fit yet? Do they fit yet? Um, pinching, grabbing, measuring, excessive weighing. Um, these are all things that are just, just set people up for, for unhappiness because the kind of information you might be looking for um, Certainly the thing that I hear a lot is, well, I want to see if I'm, if I'm getting fatter. That's a common thing people say. They're like, oh, I need to look in the mirror and check my profile because I don't know, maybe I've gotten fatter. But the information you get from checking in the mirror, you can imagine, is not very helpful. I mean, it will tell you, what, since 2 o'clock have you gotten fatter? I mean, I, I mean it's not going to tell you that. It's, so um, it's very rare that you get any feedback that would make you feel better or give you the information you need. Um, and is there really an accurate way to find out this information? I mean, perhaps there is, but certainly not through body checking. So in that situation, we advise people to literally just practice stopping that completely. I mean, it's just sort of a, just exit out. You do not need to do that body checking. You can think about what's normative, you know, how much time do you need in the mirror to check how you look? And how often during the day do you check in the mirror, for instance? You know, you might check your hair in the beginning of the day, maybe after you eat lunch, you might check your teeth. You know, there's the different things that you would do, but you certainly wouldn't check as often as people who do a lot of that body checking do. So, um, and pinching and grabbing those things, I mean, there's no real use for those things in everyday life. So, um, we would say just, you need to practice not doing those things. Um, 
so, so a few take home messages here then just to kind of round it all out is that the goal I think for everyone, no matter how extreme your body dissatisfaction is, is to develop compassion for and acceptance of one's own body. You know, it really is the only one you've got and you spend your life hating it. It's, it's going to drive you nuts. It really does. <laughs> um, and you don't have to look a certain way to start feeling better about your body. This is one that I think a lot of people have a lot of trouble with, to think about that, right, you know, what you look like today, how you look right this moment is great and you can just begin to accept it and love it and um, accept it, respect it, and that's, um, that's a great goal. Um, and finally, that by improving your body image, you actually could enhance your health goals. You can have an easier time eating the way you want to be eating um, and feel more at peace with that. Be less preoccupied with food and, and uh, even preoccupied with exercise, which happens to people too. Um, and I'll leave you, Ellen DeGeneres, her show was at UW the other day, so I found this quote and I liked it. I like Ellen. She says, to me, beauty is about being comfortable in our own skin. And it's about knowing and accepting who you are. And those two dimensions, comfortable in your own skin and accepting who you are. So I'll end there, and I thought I might open up for questions or comments or reflections that people might have. Oh, that was wonderful. I actually had a, I really responded to that point you made about uh, you don't have to love your parents. And I bet you, you know, does anyone love their body? I don't see any hands up. <laughs> love how you look. You know, being accepting and being happy with it, I think, is so much better. And it's just, it's away from that whole Hollywood shtick, too. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, let's open up for any questions, and, and um, please feel free to step up. What'd y'all think? <laughs> yeah. There was one of the slides that showed that, um, you know, your body appearance is that, if you were looking at somebody else looking at you. Mm -hmm. um, I just know that since I've started to lose weight, I've had people at work saying, you look better. And that really motivated me. Oh, I see. Yeah. So instead of... I don't know if that's a negative thing. Right. You know, that's interesting. So so that kind of positive reinforcement of, hey, you look, you look good. Now, it's funny because some people tell me that they get those comments and they actually really don't like those comments because it makes them feel like, oh gosh, did I look horrible before? And what if I regain the weight and just the psychological kind of pressure you know, starts building? I'm like, oh no, what happens? Um, but I think if that's personally reinforcing for, for you or for anyone, I mean, that's a, I think that can be a positive thing. Yeah, as long as you don't start looking at the negative side of it. But, yeah, that's good. the concept that you can't, that you will take worse care of yourself if you're feeling worse about yourself. And I always thought, oh man, you know, when I put on weight, and that should be a great motivation to lose weight, right? I'm like, I, I'm not where I want to be, I don't look the way I want to look in this outfit I used to look great in. And in fact, every single time me, the worse I feel about myself, the worse I treat myself. Right. I don't exercise, I eat worse, I sit down with a jar of Nutella, I, it's, um, I drink more, it's just terrible. Yeah. And I find the better I feel about myself every single time, the better I treat myself and the easier it is to stick to a really healthy diet because I want to. Yeah. Because I'm proud of how I take care of myself. Isn't that, that, that that's a really good point. And I'm thinking about too how um, I'm such a cynic about about advertisers and so on, but they they really their aim is to make you think that there is something wrong with the way you look and that you should be unhappy with how you are, like, you know, you deserve this or, you know, you know. Haven't you always wanted to have the perfect abs or those kinds of things? And it just presumes and, and makes you start to think, well, maybe I do. I really want to have perfect. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't like the way my abs look. And, and um, it sort of instills this idea that we should be unhappy with our bodies in order to, to get these great results or something. But um, but to your point, too, I know I don't know if, if any of you here have had this experience, but you um, when you exercise regularly, you actually really feel like feel more compelled to eat in a way that makes you feel good too. You know, you're more likely to go for lots of fruits and vegetables and kind of stay away more from fried foods and so on just because you're like, that just feels better. You know, you just feel like inspired to take care of yourself better. And I think that, that they've, they've done, some of the research they've done on exercise in particular has shown that even independent of any body changes that take place, that your body image does improve. And so um, I think by feeling better about yourself, you're right, you do want to just take care of yourself more and, and um, you're going to feel more confident in your ability to, to really manage how you eat and live in other areas too. Yeah, I was just curious in that study, 
what were some of the ideas that were done I mean, that helped in your perception of your body image? That's a really good question. So the, the, what kind of exercises maybe, and, and when I say exercises, I'm thinking of more like thought exercises and behavioral exercises to do for body image. Um, well, for body dissatisfaction, the kinds of things, and I'll give you some examples, this isn't comprehensive at all, but some of the things you do for just that discrepancy between what you think you want and what you think you are, um, is to, to really um, be much more conscious and, and um, critically minded about that, to think what is that ideal and is that really ideal for me and is that even ideal for anyone? Um, you know, is Nicole Richie's body shape, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Nicole Richie or body shape, but is that going to be for everyone? I mean, I certainly couldn't look like that and I don't think 99.9% .9 of the population could either. Um, so um, for, for that to think about, to challenge some of that, like what is that, what is, where are you at and where is that ideal at? And in terms of where are you at too, that's something where um, you would, you might, especially if you're working with a therapist, we do things like, um, <coughs> uh, one, phrase, one term for it is called a, a, kind of a mirror exercise, I guess, where you sit in front of a mirror and you actually observe your body in a very non-evaluative way, which you would not believe how hard this is to do. Um, it, you know, you, you really just look at finding words to describe your body instead of saying, oh, you know, lumpy, covered in cellulite, round, um, although round is a non-evaluative word, uh, potentially, um, but you really look for just adjectives to describe your body instead of the more judgmental kind of terms. And it's a really good exercise to just sort of force yourself to, to step out of the um, kind of mindset we've all been acculturated to since the day we really were self-aware, I would say. Um, <clears throat> So that would be looking at just sort of body dissatisfaction, some ideas for that. And then for, in terms of your investment in your body image, um, and these overlap, by the way, because they're not totally independent concepts, but um, you might do things like, um, uh, you remember those assumptions, there was like probably 10 assumptions there. We would do things like thought logs, where you begin to catch yourself over the course of a day, um, noticing things about your body. Um, and triggers to negative body image, really. And these can be so diverse. I mean, it could be that you put your jeans in the dryer and you put them on in the morning, you think, oh my gosh, they're so tight. And you start to feel kind of icky about the way you look. And, and most people, we just sort of zoom through that. We kind of last with you. You feel kind of icky then for the next few hours or whatever. But, but um, the purpose of this is to put it on slow motion. Think about, okay, what just made me feel bad about the way I look? Oh, it's my jeans that were in the dryer. And then you start to pull that apart even more and start to challenge it and think, well, are these jeans, you know, am I really getting bigger or are these jeans just getting smaller? And it's, they're jeans out of the dryer, of course, it's because the jeans have actually shrunk. But, um, but that's something that you just won't necessarily notice unless you're really attending, attending to it and aware and are challenging, really challenging um, what the assumptions are. Or another one being that people won't accept you for the way you look. That's a thought that um, might come up in people's minds just automatically. You're not even aware of it um, on a day to day level, but if you catch it, you know, you kind of catch a situation, um, I'll give you a more specific example. Let's say you're walking down the hall or you're getting on the bus and you get kind of a, a, a stink eye from a stranger and you're thinking, like, what the heck, what just happened? If you have kind of a bias towards negative body image, you might think, oh, they, they're being rude to me. They don't like me because of the way I look and people are judging me and, and blah, blah, blah. You're kind of mind reading almost. Um, that would be another incident that might co go into a, a thought record and you would look at that and really challenge it and, and decide, are people really judging you for the way you look or are you mind reading? Um, now, the effect of this isn't that it all goes away and you're like, oh, no, it's not that important in my life and I'm, I'm fine. It, what it really does though is it takes this big dial of dissatisfaction or, or emotional kind of reaction to that dissatisfaction and just takes that dial and just dials it down. That volume dials down and you become really flexibly minded and, and almost like a I like to think of it like a detective, you know, you're just sort of like, that's it. No, no, there's no, there's actually no, no reason why this person might be judging me. They'd probably just give me the stink eye because they missed their stop or something. Um, so that would be one challenge. And then also more generally this idea of um, uh, looking at other areas of self-esteem in one's life. I think a lot of the people that I've worked with, um, I'm thinking about some people who um, struggle with binge eating disorder. They, they've really like, reached a point in their life where they're dissatisfied in many other areas of their life and they're kind of looking to change their eating and fix their eating to really solve sort of, sort of some of their overall um, happiness issues. And so in those situations, it is good to look at, well, what else brings you joy? What else brings you happiness? How can we kind of make your life more rich instead of focusing it all on 
how your body looks and how your weight is. There's so much more than that. Um, so those are some ideas, yeah. And there's a lot of, and actually in this body image workbook, they go through quite in, in quite a lot of detail a lot of these exercises too. So it's it's a good read if you're interested. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.